Hi, this is Ian Peterman, and I'm here with John to talk about, well, people and how, how, how working with them and how we can optimize and just your experience with it. Uh, and so I guess from here, just take it over. What, it, what are your thoughts? What's been your experience and how? Well, I have to I have to say that my, my experience is maybe a little um, I'm a product development person. I have uh, 30 years of, auto, of product development work, either as an engineer or project manager or something like that it, or a manager. So the perspective I'm going to talk about is mostly going to be from that, although, you know, I didn't I didn't come out of high school and go straight into that. I, I did a bunch of other stuff before that I worked at fast food restaurants, worked in the tobacco fields. But most of this context is going to be in a more complex situation, distributed teams. And um, like we were just talking about before we, before we started, the whole workload and the amount of distractions, the amount of projects, the amount of things that people are supposed to focus on, focus on <laughs> these sort of things make it difficult to uh, to develop a team and not, not just to develop a team, but successfully complete the work expediently. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. There's a lot of a lot of distractions. Both yeah, and, and in our self in, <laughs> Yeah, and there's bones in their pocket and they're self-inflicted as many times. The business says, you know, hires has, has this group of people to do some work and they and rather than focus them on one or two projects, they're they're all maybe they're carrying different six or seven or even more. I know a project manager is carrying close to ten, actually more than ten. And I'm pretty sure that that's not very helpful. Uh, and and I, I imagine his team members, because I have worked at this place that he works at, his, the team members are probably carrying something similar in terms of what, what their workload is. And so we're struggling with opportunity costs, distractions from other, pri other projects, competing priorities. Which one of these is number one? Well, probably all of it. That's right. what the manage, management may say, or your manager might say, or even if they cut it in half. Okay, you have six priorities out of 12. That's still not really much of a prioritization and yeah. hardly sustainable. No, not sustainable for very for any long duration of time, at least with your sanity intact <laughs> and, yeah. and, client, and clients happy with you. And, and motivation too, you know? If, yeah. Some people like to like to work hard or towards some goal all long right. hours, they might be all right with that. But there's a difference between working long hours on a thing and making some progress on that a thing, or maybe a couple of things, and working long hours trying to keep all the plates in the air, and none of them may be very successful because we haven't dedicated the actual time, the requisite time to make them successful, entirely successful. Right. I feel like that's, you mentioned the sustainability of people. There's, there's a, we have a high burnout culture, just kind of, we, we love to glorify, you know, the startup, work in your garage, hundred hours a week, then made it. And we kind of ignore the fact that 90 plus percent fail. Yes. <laughs> we never see the light of day uh, because they didn't make it. They couldn't do it. And but even then, when you're in a startup, the one that's just one thing. You are focused on one thing. It's your thing too. So you have oh, yeah. right. There's this much higher percentage of you is like, well, this is mine. This is me. I don't have a boss telling me what to do. This isn't something I hate. Like I love it. It's usually a passion project. That's why. That's why you're doing a hundred hours. Yes, and you're <laughs> right. all right with it. Yeah, and you're okay friend, with it. I have uh, a friend of mine that owns Raptor Performance, and he he works those kind of hours, but. He, I don't think it bugs him by and large. It's like, it's, this is what I want to do this anyway. Right. And when you cross into that space where it's something I have to do and something I love to do, and I would be doing this outside of work hours anyway, and you found that thing like that, you can, you can put a hundred hours in. That's totally fine. There's the other bucket though, that most of us <laughs> live in of, I got a job, it pays me, but don't love it. It's not, like, you can't even compare that, the amount of burnout that you get you can't sustain it as much as an employee working on something you don't like, or like you're saying split projects. Like that's yeah. singular focus is so much more maintainable yeah. <laughs> as, a, in, as a person. 
Yeah, exactly. It, 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 and the, there's a continuity of it, and it's like you're trying to attain a goal with that particular thing. I, I worked, I worked as a um, uh, technical project manager on it. Uh, actually, won one of these awards back here behind me. ICO five project was a, for Volvo trucks, and yeah. that was a lot of hours. But it was a singular a focus. It wasn't just me; it was the whole entire team. And there was there was something more than just the fact that we were focused on this interesting technology and software and hardware application. But it was also that it was a differentiator from the way this comp- this part of the company had worked in the past. As in, mm. in the past, when this part of the company wanted something hardware or software design, a lot of that load would be done in Europe. Okay. Um, and in this case, the all of it was done in the U.S. And mm-hmm. with this group of people, we we joked. It. I don't know if just coming off the Thanksgiving holidays, um, you might know down here in the South. I don't know if it's everywhere, but in the South, you have big family things at Thanksgiving, and you have a table where the adults sit, and you mm-hmm. have what we call the little people's table, right? I'm definitely, I was definitely sat at that table as a kid. <laughs> okay. So it's, maybe it's not just a Southern thing. It's a, it's a, it's a thing, period. It's a thing. It's, it's a thing. Maybe it's even Canadian. Okay. So we, we had this analogy that up until this point, we had been sitting effectively at the little boy table. We would, little guy's table, little people's table. We would write the specs for what was going to go on. We would guide the hardware and we would talk about what we wanted in the software and how it needed to work. But we didn't actually do the work. Right. That was all headed to some other part of the company. And that part of the company did the, the work and we would take and get that product from them and we would test it and make sure it actually worked what we thought it was. And in this case, none of that was going to be the case. It was going to be we design the hardware, send it off to some place to design it. Um, we set the stipulations on the hardware, not necessarily design the nuts and bolts, but the stipulations on the hardware. And then also did the software. Here's, here's what the software should look like, and here's what we're going to write to make it work like we want it to work uniquely for us because we don't have the same product as that other part of the company. Mm. So the, in this case, the compelling, the, compelling reason, the compelling part of the project was in, in addition to the technology engagement was the, was the, you know what? We're doing something really cool here that has not been done on this site. Ray, you're a bit of trailblazer and also like a almost a rite of passage. Like, all right, we're gonna we get to play with the big boys now. We're allowed to we're allowed in the big boy sandbox and we yes. we get to do it ourselves. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It had moved away from spec writing and that that kind of level of work to we're just gonna do it and we can do it. Of course we weren't all that sure because we none that group of people had not done this kind of work together before. Right, we've done that kind of work separately other places, but not here and not this way. And well, there were some significant differences. In this. I think that plays into the ownership part because you guys got to own it because it meant something for the team. It didn't just oh we're making another product today, cool. It was when when you own it, it means something more than just check a box, completed my project, get a paycheck, <laughs> right? I, that, yes, added this yeah. level of. Uh, ownership which lets you work more <laughs> right it, it connects you to the to the outcome in a different way even if it wasn't necessarily mon- it, let me rephrase even though it was not monetary right other than right. do this don't do this do something else we still would have a job there doing another working on another project we probably still have a job there. It just wouldn't be this thing but right. it, the thing itself was engaging in that differentiator from how it had been and when you and when we think about like sustainability of people, there's there's only a certain financial number, and like used to be seventy thousand. I'm sure it's up now thanks to inflation and all that. But there's <laughs> there's a number where after that point, it just you you have all your food, you have your needs, you, your rent is paid, you have some savings. There's retirement going on. You're not worried about any of your kids. You can take care of your dog or your cat. Like you're, your basic human needs are all taken care of. And so after that, there's like this diminishing return for the majority of population on like 
money as a motivator. It doesn't really, like I was you're talking about, oh, huge amounts, but still it's like that point where you do then need an additional motivator. How do you get your team to work more? You've already crossed that like minimum threshold of all your basics are taken care of. There has to be some other motivator. Money isn't just going to be as, yep. easy, <laughs> as easy as yeah. the food, you, you can throw money at people and they go, well, and you'd see this big improvement, but that's not what happens. It's not. It's no. it, it does to a certain point, and then it stops. It just and then it just does that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's and it's often what I, from the studies I've read. It's been a while now, but those things are temporary too. When they do happen, right? Throw money at it, motivation goes up, and then you know a few months later, maybe six months later, we're back to essentially where we are. That it, it's a transitory motivation at, at best. It's trend, yeah, transitory. Yeah, motivation at best. Probably not even that. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Maybe. Six months, especially in product development, where it can be an 18-month life cycle. Yeah. Six months of motivation doesn't even get you halfway there. No. And you, and no. you don't want to do raises every six months just to... Any company will go out of business with that kind of cycle. Exactly. So I think there's this whole... And there is this whole science to, like how do you get your team motivated how do you not burn them out so they still have energy <laughs> to yeah. be motivated about and they're not worn at the end so that they need about a year off or right. a year taking soft work to kind of heal up from the hundreds of thousands hundreds of hours of overtime in the course of a year right often uncompensated because you're an engineer in this case so yeah when you're when you're the uh was it salary there's yeah. a new type of salary. There's a salary that doesn't get overtime and the one that does. And, and most people don't get the overtime. No, they don't. No. It's, uh, so. But there's more to it than the, the product, too. It's also the team, the environment that the people, that which the people are working. Um, I think that mm -hmm. has a, and that's going to always depend on who's, who's on the team, right? And right. Personality types. What is your, if you think it's like a team, team dynamics that you've been involved with where there was the most longevity and the most sustainability to the team where there was low burnout. What would you, what would you describe that kind of dynamic and how management looked at it and how the team looked, looked at it and worked together? What, what is that from your experience? Well, I'd say that one of the first things is going to be that, there's a certain measure of fun in the work. Right. Um, I can think of the teams that I've been on and they've been very few in 30 years. There might be three, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in those, in those teams, there was a, a level of jokery going on, a little bit of tomfoolery and a lot of hard work, right? right. And it was an open environment to allow that. Nobody got no nothing. Nothing was taken personal. It was that's just how it was. No, nobody was out to be mean spirited to anybody. But we would joke with each other um, quite frequently. Not immediately. Don't get me wrong. We didn't throw, throw each other together and all of a sudden start <laughs> calling each other. You know, uh, pointing out each other's foibles. Not calling each other. But pointing out each other's. That didn't happen like that. It was more of a. Uh, work together, get to a point where you can kind of trust what you look for the other person's opinion or perspective and try to do something with that. Um, openly do these things. And I think you kind of tie people and connect people together to the point where they start to feel comfortable actually cutting up a little bit and exposing some part of themselves, not literally, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that helps in driving a team or that group of people into a, into a team in my mind. Right. So there, so there definitely the, the lightheartedness, which is always good, <laughs> less, less stressful. Um, but, also, but you have to balance that with the, with the demands of the job. Not everything can be, uh, you know, not everything can be catastrophic, taken like that's catastrophic. Right. If it's like that, that's just oppressive. You, you can't go the extra mile working all those extra hours is not going to work when you're, you think it's all doom and gloom the whole time. <laughs> yeah, there needs to be, uh, you need to have some some amount of 
ducks back, just let it roll off. Uh, can't sweat every little thing. <laughs> yeah. All. yeah. Which having a having a good team that can that is all at least mostly that way all the time or most of the time, then there's always at least a certain percentage that are always feeling good that at that point that can help yep. balance the uh the rest of the team who might take <laughs> take that first particular event that day a little yeah. a little worse and balance balance it out. Uh yeah. how you you mentioned it, the the structure being a, a lot more open. Is that something that the team itself in your experience cultivates or does that man like a management down the management wow. says keeps it loose and open or the team just says, ah, hey, we're going to be this way anyway, but we're so good at it. Management's going to be okay. Okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think in general management might say those words, but uh, following up and actually acting in accordance with that's not necessarily, it's really tough to be consistent with that message, I think. Right. Uh, and, and it didn't, it happened within the team kind of organic. It starts off a little right. more tense and, Right. <laughs> don't really know how to talk to each other and kind of a, maybe a little bit afraid to say something blatant or mm -hmm. abrupt, thinking that it might be interpreted poorly. I think part of it is getting past that 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 lump. And then I think the person who's got the most contact away from the team, that my role was up was uh, was some technical pieces, but also the project part of it. Right, so I helped structure the. the Build the team, create the team, structure the timeline, work with the team to estimate, perform the estimates. And these are the things we're going to build now for the first iteration for the develop for the um, test guys to put it on the vehicle and and you know explore it. And this is the next chunk, and this is the next chunk. We work together to produce those things. But there are times when when something happens external to the company that actually that intrudes in this space and can and can set this space on uh, that a little bit on fire mm -hmm. and you have to know when when you need to let them burn a little bit as in uh, vent this can't you say this is another opportunity this is an opportunity for us to work long hours or this is an opportunity for us to go up on the mountain and reprogram vehicles in the rain on a cold day these aren't opportunities these, we all know what these are we have to do them but they are not necessarily opportunities Right, and and so you have, in my mind, you have to let that let that heat off from the team. Maybe even start it. As in, I know you know that they're angry, but they're not going to pop off. And maybe they need to have a safe space to let that to say what they really think about this, rather than put on the 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 face. Right, hurry up, get past it. This sucks. Now you, now your turn. Tell me what you think about this situation. <laughs> Right, right. Ten, ten minutes later, we've all voiced our thing. All right, now what are we going to do? Because it's not going away, and it's we need and we need and we need to do this, right? We need to fix this. Right, and I think conventional wisdom is that we don't do those things. Now, I, I find that that works, but maybe it's anecdotal that it works, rather than suppress or get people to. Rather than spin something is good when we all know that it's not. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm very much in your camp. When 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 it smells like crap, it is. <laughs> I mean, Wait, so I'll just <laughs> that's how it is. Like, don't tell me it's a gift. <laughs> like, yes, this is just accept it. It's this is not ideal. I don't want to do this. I don't want to no. do this really terrible thing, muck in the mud, to go get to a stuck vehicle to try to fix it. Yeah, or work through the Thanksgiving holidays because of some poor decision not in our team. So okay. over that way, they made a really bad decision. Being on call because that group, that group is yes. bad, and now I get to be on call while they're on break. And yes. That, don't sell that to me as a good thing. Yeah, this is not an opportunity. No. I'm, maybe there will be some benefit, but tell me that like two weeks after. Right. <laughs> once once we've done it and I can maybe see some benefit. But as of right now, like this is just let me deal with it. So Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure repressing these things or suppressing these things are all that there's are all that great. There I mean there's whole studies I there's 
there's therapists that deal with people just on repressed anger and emotions like it's it's a it's not good there's no there's no, no, there's no part of repressing it, your emotions that is ever it doesn't work out and whether you know not everybody ends up in going going to see a therapist later but the fact that therapists do that work means that there's there is something so maybe you should just yeah. avoid it let it out if you if you can just do it in a controlled safe like what you're saying create like a 10 minute small don't eat up your whole day yep but instead of walking around simmering anger <laughs> for two days maybe just spend two minutes yes and this sucks so much yeah. i don't want to do this this is terrible yeah. In truth tell, I would use the F bomb in those events. I would oh. I would lead it off with the just just set it. Set it yes. so and follow. And maybe here's the tone. Boom. <laughs> you can be more gentle if you want, but yep. just... you can also dogpile. I understand. Well there's I I just watched uh oh what is it? The hist I we watched part of the history of swear words on Netflix, which is great. Because they brought on some people. You should watch it. <laughs> I see you taking notes. Um, <laughs> and one of the things they, they talked to some people like psychologists and linguists and all kinds of people, like, like the history of the word and all that stuff. But they also talked about the there's proven if you're cussing and like serious, it needs to be a real cuss word. It can't just be, oh, darn. Like <laughs> you've got to actually mean it your grip strength goes up by like 20 percent if you are passing while you're gripping you your pain tolerance goes up some crazy like 20 30 50 percent it's good and they do it like people stick their hands in ice bowls and they're you're not allowed to cast i do that and there's people that go from like one minute to two minutes long before they pull their hand out just if you're casting you get to go twice yeah wow (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. I need to watch it. There's this whole, is it interesting? Because apparently this whole psychology, there's like specialist people that study swear words and how it works with people. And so it's just this emotion, your body, there's like a specific part of the brain yeah. <laughs> that it has to do with like part of your reptile brain somewhere. And it fires off and it, it helps your nervous system just like work better a little bit. So Nice. This whole your whole thing of oh maybe it'll it probably will work for everyone. You just set the pace and be like here, just let it out. Like, yeah, <laughs> just let it out, man. Just do it. I think the key is to know when those when it's those events and not the little ones. You can't be popping off every time some little trauma. You, Correct. Like you said earlier, water off the duck's back. But some of these more egregious ones, we should not try to stuff it in a sack. We should. When it's a boulder, just yep. call the boulder. Call it. Call it what it is. <laughs> it's a steaming pile of something not great. That's right. <laughs> And just yeah. let it go. Then we can let it go. Then we can walk by yeah. it and leave it behind. Then we, and go pick up our shovels and go to work. That's right. Yeah. Um, and I think the other part, probably lastly, whoever is facing, you know, that's the inward part of the team facing. But somebody has to face outward and say what mm-hmm. the truth is of that team so that, okay, y'all know that this is the situation we find ourselves in. We don't, this is not desirable. This is not helpful. But, you know, and articulate that. Um, even if you know it's not going to be received well by the executive, rather than cover the, situ- the circumstances up, you you honestly hit, honestly attack that or, or make that known. Right. Well, there's there's something definitely always to be said about self-advocacy, whether it's an individual saying, hey, this sucks. <laughs> you just told me to do a really te- terrible, crappy job. Yeah. I hate. Or as a group saying, Hey, management or Hey, client, Hey, customer, you, you've just requested or created this event. Doesn't, you don't have to do it in an attacking way, but just in a, Hey, Hey guys, this is like the actual picture of reality right now. We're going to take care of it. Don't worry, but this is a mess. Yep. <laughs> we have to point it out so that we don't go here. Can, again. We, can we do less of this? For example, exactly and i i think that was something that we talked about a couple of weeks ago before the holidays was the whole repeating like making sure that people know and understand how did we get here <laughs> why yep. are we doing this thing that nobody wants to do yep and how do we how do we make sure that 
our clients, our management, our team members, our other team over there, <laughs> well, whoever it is, make sure we don't repeat, repeat that. And in that self advocacy way, like, hey, this is impacting this whole group of people. We have 10 people that are all going to not have a Thanksgiving now because of this. Of, of that, right. So right what can we do to not do this again come Christmas? Exactly. Or my what are the next one is going to be? Yeah. My team would really like to have Christmas break. Can we? <laughs> <laughs> Especially since Thanksgiving is what it is. <laughs> exactly. So can we avoid, like, how do we not repeat this in uh, 30 days? Yeah. yeah. And, and you're right. That has to be somewhat kind of diplomatic about that because you, you could, we can't get into this finger pointing contest with folks, but neither can the organization, um, organization's management fix what they do not know or are unaware of. Right. If there's, if there's no feedback loop, there can be no improvement. There can be no improvement. Yeah, exactly. The whole okay. one of one of the things that I've I really everybody points out in in everything. It's like being aware awareness. No, if nobody knows that the oceans are full of plastic, nobody can do anything about it. If nobody knows your team is burned out because yeah. everyone's afraid to or they don't feel like they can, well, you can't. And, you know, the manager could be really, really nice and just doesn't know. They're like, oh, they keep saying yes to everything. It's, this is fine. This is fine. Yeah. And the reality of the team is dying and they're like, they're just not, there's no feedback loop. There's nothing and without that feedback loop. You can't change anything. Client doesn't know anything. Customer doesn't, nobody knows anything. Yeah. That's everybody fine. thinks we're on a nice slide glide path because nobody right. says we're not so the assumption is unless we see evidence otherwise or hear something otherwise that everything's golden so right in general i think humans are for the most part optimistic creatures and they suffer from a little bit of optimism bias <laughs> um, yeah i think we do yeah so unless it's in their face they probably we don't notice it as a as it's an issue until somebody actually points it out. And even then we're probably like, is this really an issue? I want to show me how this becomes a problem. Um, can you confirm that? Do you have a yeah. Walk me through how this is an issue because I can't really see how it can bother anybody. Right. You know, that kind of thing. Right, which is and that's a good point on, on like communicating and how, how to do so is making sure that it's understandable. Like, oh, well, because you got to make sure the other person understands, like, maybe it's a problem for you, but for them, it's not. They're like, oh, that's easy. Like, well, yep. but I'm not you. <laughs> Neither is my team, right? Yeah, right. Or maybe they're missing some. What I find is that if, you, if you're in an organization where uh, they're usually called functional organizations, many people call them siloed organizations, mm -hmm. you build something and you're going to hand that to me. Maybe you write a spec, customer spec, and you give that to me, and then we turn that into. A, a detailed technical spec and and the actual product you design. Okay, so what you hand to us has some bearing on what we can build. Right? It influences what right. you build, and the quality of that input has some impact on the quality of the out outcome in right. those kind of organizations. You can only you can only do so much to, to you know whatever you're given. You can't make you can't make gold out of a pig's ear. Right. I know. Right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I tried. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I thought that might be the fast forward to financial independence. Yeah, it didn't work out. <laughs> Subtext, no, it didn't work. <laughs> exactly. But uh, I, in fact, I had a, I have a story. But I worked at a, on another project, and there was a, it was a senior engineer who was writing some technical specs for the product, and then my team was going to actually do the work turning that, that technical spec in, into the product. And, uh, he wrote the first technical spec, and I'm like, well, this is not really going to work for us. We, I don't know what you're saying here, and you're missing a lot of stuff. So I said, here, here are the questions we need you to answer when it comes to the, to the, to the spec. You tell us what this does. Tell us what how this what this subsystem does. Who it interacts with. What the messages are. What various configurations we can expect of what those outputs should look like. And um, I actually built a, an outline for him to work from. And that didn't work out either. Uh, so we ended up having to have yet a third part of the company do the work. And, and I would work with them to because he could he tried twice and he, he couldn't do it. 
and it just wasn't there. And the first time I hand that to the software folks and you start working that with the software folks, we're like, we can't do anything with this. I mean, I don't even know what this means. Um, I'm not sure how to structure the software. I'm not sure what parameters need to be involved. You know, and and so we couldn't even start. Hmm. I was it was it just a communication level, just speaking two different languages, basically. Of I think it was. I think it was more of a experience based. His experience was not in this exact area. He mm. was an engineer, more in um, maybe how facing out to the customer, and okay. then it was into the minutia of how to make thing, how to make systems work, which is a a little bit different. It's a little more maybe hardcore at the systems level. Yeah, the people the people that sit in between that that translate they really are translators. Like, <laughs> being out the the customer the customer isn't going to know every. I, sometimes they do right, but usually the reason they're coming to you is because you're the expert and can right. do all the minutia. <laughs> and they right. say, "I want outcome X," and you go, "Well, I'll you know A through A through Z over here will get you there." And they go, "Well, we don't know that alphabet." We know X. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Give us X. Yep. We got one thing. That's that's it. Go do go do whatever you got to do. Pick whatever alphabet over there. We speak X. <laughs> yeah, we speak X. Yeah, exactly. And 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 in fact, though, they might even put something together. A lot of times, I, and I love it. I have seen this where the there are contradictions in their even in their customer ease. That you probably don't pick it out when you're saying it as a customer, but when you start to translate that into engineering stuff. And you're like, well, it can't simultaneously be lightweight, for example, and have a battery life that means you have this kind of duration of, of system availability. You're going to have to have a heavy battery to have that amount of duration of time. They, 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 they really want anti gravity. Just figure that out there. Yeah, exactly. But, but they don't know where the limits are. It's, right. it's not their expertise, of course. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's that, that balance of, communication and scope and expectation setting and accountability and yep. feedback loop of and asking questions and keeping asking questions <laughs> ask the questions give the feedback no it can't be lightweight and last for three days we can do right half a day we can get you 12 yep. hours we can find some middle ground where you can get maybe two days but it's going to be a little bit heavy <laughs> right exactly so Where's the balance point? Right. Where's the balance point? What are the trade-offs? What 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 is the most important? What is the next most important? But, right. And 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 that's helpful to tie the team together too. When you find out what the most important things are to get, then you kind of this is part of that whole duck water off the duck back. When you know what's most important, the other parts can kind of they're not focused. On. Right. They fall off to the side a little bit. Well, that will help. That helps your your poor project manager with 12, 12 projects. <laughs> yes. My guess is that that guy has got, I have one important thing in half of them and nothing in the others. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was the, probably the only way to manage that. Yeah, I need to, I need to touch base with him again. because I was complaining about the six or seven that I have. And he said he had that many in my, Ooh, that doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> I think I've managed five, Five, well, six, maybe at most, but definitely not the best place to be. No. <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine 12. 12 would be, there's balls being dropped somewhere. I yeah. Don't, I, don't, I don't even know where the balls are being dropped. <laughs> yeah, just, without, a, without a doubt. Yeah, because it's six. I'm like, which one of these is this one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. When you have to re-familiarize yourself with the project. Yeah. What's actively going on right now, it's it's uh, a little overload. <laughs> yeah, the the tools kind of help. Like, uh, what is that notebook? I, I keep a separate virtual notebook for each one of them, so that's helpful. So once I figure out what we're talking about, I can go to my virtual notebook and, right. <laughs> and get my get my heel down right. You know, I can I can start to figure out what we're talking about. But yeah, ambush me in the hall and try to catch me. I'm like, oh, which one is that? <laughs> Wait, who are you? Yes, <laughs> it's been it's been too long. I've talked to twenty other people just in the last hour. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Remind me who you are. Need name badges and your project <laughs> listed on your name badge. So yes. you know project what, what, name and project number. <laughs> exactly. 
That way I can look it up as you're saying hi. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, awesome. Well, I, this has been great. I, there's, we've talked about a lot of fun things <laughs> with people. And uh, I, I think I'd like to kind of, as a last question, what would be, if you were to pick the three things that you've, you've experienced, top three things that help help teams and not be not be that poor burned out person <laughs> uh, what what are the three that you would pick as like the best top things that really would make the most impact from what you've seen okay I, i'd say much, so <laughs> one of them has to be get to a place with your team where where you can be open with the way things are and that means in yourself as well you know you get to the you want to be able to be tell the rest of the folks, I, I'm really not where I'd like to be today, or I don't believe the team is where it should be today, or mm -hmm. something like that. You got to get that that dialogue where you can say things like that, and I think that's that's going to be part of that that open atmosphere, that joking around, that working hard together, that recognizing the contribution of each team member, and if the team member is not able to con contribute, then you have to find some other way, and that might include removing that team member from the from the team uh, and finding a new team member that can, that can do this part of the work. So right. I think the first thing is getting that environment right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the second is if you're the person who's I hate to use the word leader, but if you're the person that's kind of guiding that effort, you got to know when you have to let know when circumstances are trending in a way that they are going to need to pop off or have some external um, tangible demonstration of their interpretation of the circumstances. Right. Expression. Yes. <laughs> Expression. And, 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 there. and this shouldn't cost anybody anything. You know, <laughs> go ahead and say it. <laughs> right. We're not, and we're not going to hold it against you. In fact, we're feeling the same way. Um, <laughs> right. We're, we're probably feeling the same way. Right. There's probably uh, some camaraderie around your feelings, actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so that the communication, the environment development is important to allow the second thing to happen, right? Right. And then, as the also is, you got to have their back when it comes right down to it. So, if something is turbulent on the outside, you have to kind of deflect it. And if you can, you got to try to affect the change. Even I've had team members say, "I was call me Don Quixote." Because they would be they would be perturbed by something outside, and they would believe that nothing was going to change that. And they were probably right. But you know what I would do anyway? It's bugging you. It's a valid issue. I'm going to go take it to the director. <laughs> right? <laughs> nothing would happen, but they knew that if they had a valid concern, that I was going to um, push it up the chain. I, I give you an example of this. We had a we had a project. This project was demanding huge amounts of overtime because of the, the short schedule. Mm -hmm. And there was a mandatory meeting uh, that the company expected everybody to attend. I told my group, don't attend. You know, it was a couple of hours every, I don't know, every two weeks or something like that. And I, and and there was pressure to get them to attend. And I'm thinking. I'm not telling people to work or asking people to work 60 hours a week so that they can come in here and spend two hours every week or so on this topic, dragging them away from the right. objective. That's adding another two hours or taking away two hours on the front. Plus, so plus I, focus time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Two hours out. That's plus time, out time, plus time, back time. Right. right? <laughs> ah, if that makes any sense. <laughs> But yeah, so I'm like, no, this I'm not. This is not going to happen. Right. So the manager that was pushing, yeah, they will. I'm like, no, I'm not. They're not doing it. And I told him, you're not doing that. We're not. We're not working 64 hours in a week so that you can accommodate this. You know, right. we we'll just keep working our regular overtime, and that's out. And I took it out, and, and that one I won. But a lot of times you don't. But just the fact that you're willing to go to bat, mm -hmm. um, I think nice. tells them something about this this thing that they're working 
Well, that's the it's you being their advocate makes makes you their ally, right? You become you become someone that they can actually trust. Like, oh well, a he he hears me, <laughs> he understands me. He's, there's no confusion in translation. He actually knows what what's bugging me, and I can't. I'm not in a position to be able to you know push it up as far as it could go, and he is so. And he's doing it. He's he's saying, "Oh, it's valid. I'm going to help you. I'm going to advocate for you." And no, we don't win them all, <laughs> because, yeah, or many, <laughs> or, or many, you know. But but it's it's. I think that that case, it really is the effort that counts. It's, hey, I'm I'm here supporting you. I'm going to spend my time trying to help you. And yeah. D- despite and and that in that case, it's really despite the success rate. Like, yeah, I'm still going to do it. Even <laughs> I have a yeah, even though exactly ninety nine percent of the time they they ignore everything I say, but yeah. I'm still yeah. doing it. But we might win one this time, right? We might win. It, it, it's time. definitely not when somebody takes a a takes an advocate on your behalf to the point where it might be a career a non career enhancing move. You have to take that seriously, right? You, right. You have to you have to know that that person really probably really does have your best interest at heart at least as much as they can if they're willing to eh, probably if you're bugging a direct your direct boss that much it's good go bad for your upward mobility <laughs> yes it can yeah exactly <laughs> what's all what's all this boat rocking right well, you know the boat needs to be rocked <laughs> it's because we're in stormy waters actually i'm just telling you about them <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> you're in put... the hole. you didn't know <laughs> you didn't know yeah, I'm just informing you that we've been in this boat this now for a while. <laughs> now, yeah, for a while. Now it's time to maybe think about turning the tiller in a different direction for a little bit. <laughs> exactly. Oh, awesome. Well, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, where where would you like them to go, if anywhere? Um, I'm a, I'm on LinkedIn, John 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 M Quigley at LinkedIn. And you can send me an email to john.quigley at valuetransform.com. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. This has been uh, entertaining and, and not wonderful conversation as, as our previous conversations have been. So thanks for, for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Ian. It's been a pleasure to be here, and I hope we can do this again sometime. Sounds good.